thank you for joining us. We are so pleased that so many of you have decided to uh, join in because I can tell you this is a very, very special event. It's not just a literary event, it's, uh, it has all kinds of things. You're going to thoroughly enjoy it and you won't regret it for one moment. Um, I wanted to uh, explain to you that um, we are uh, we have we're accommodating all kinds of things uh, events during this program so be ready to be surprised um, we are absolutely delighted to welcome you all here uh, and we are especially delighted to welcome our author John Willis and um, I have to tell you that he's written uh, not just one, but two fantastic books, and I'm going to show them to you now. Can you see them? I hope so. <laughs> I'm, I'm showing them to you, so I hope you can see them. And they are beautifully produced. Um, they have, as you can see, very dramatic um, covers. Secret Letters, I think, is, is so elusive and charming. And Churchill's Few shows a ridiculously young pilot in his spitfire. They are very, very um, attractive covers. And um, the books themselves are absolutely tops. Uh, they have lovely paper and wonderful clear typescript. And it's a joy to read them. I can assure you, um, I, I, I was just swept along. And I started reading Churchill's View and I thought, oh, well, this is about airplanes and things. But um, now I can tell you, I was totally uh, bowled over because they are um, such vivid books. You can, I, I felt I was almost in the battle. I now know all about um, Messerschmitt's 109s and 1010s and, and, and uh, hurricanes and spitfires because uh, John has just brought it all to life. It really is incredibly vivid. And I do congratulate him for that. But I think he's a very experienced writer. Um, anyway, um, as, I, as I say, um, I can tell you that uh, Churchill's Few is the story of um, the Battle of Britain, and it's told through the, uh, uh, the eyes of, um, uh, uh, through, the, the, uh, through six main characters and they feature throughout the book. But the, the book is packed with interesting people, absolutely packed with them. But these six men are the ones who, who, who tell the story of the Battle of Britain. And they are, in all of them, total heroes and totally unforgettable. They are, they are depicted brilliantly because fortunately, John was able to actually talk with them. So he knows them and it just makes all the difference. And, uh, they, they are a real inspiration and it's such a brilliant idea to have uh, to, to access this story in this way. Um, the, the, um, I won't say too much more. I have told you about the presentation and how beautiful they are. And um, so I, I'm now going to hand you over with, uh, without more ado to John. Jill, thank you so much for the uh the very warm welcome and warm introduction. I'd just like to start first of all by introducing my two special guests for this evening. Uh, Christine Kavanagh, who's going to uh, read some extracts from Secret Letters. Christine is a, has been a long um, standing member of the BBC Radio Drama Company. She's just finished a, a major tour of Stephen Daldry's version of An Inspector Calls. And she reminded me the other day that she once starred in the television production of the Blackheath Poisonings. There may be several people on the call tonight who are suspects. Um, so we'll hear from Christine later. Uh, and also joining me, I'm absolutely thrilled to see Robert Myers. Uh, Robert, um, as a uh, tiny boy, escaped with his mother and sister across the demarcation line uh, while the Nazis were uh, tightening the grip um, on occupied France and we're going to talk to him uh, towards the end of the evening but he's obviously got great insights into his father and mother who are right at the heart of, of secret letters. Um, but let's start first by talking about Churchill's Few, my, my first book of what's been a rather strange summer uh, but this was the 80th anniversary 
of the Battle of Britain. And as Jill said, the book paints a portrait of the Battle of Britain through the lens, through the experiences, through the eyes of six men who I would probably say were unsung heroes, if you like, uh, a sergeant pilot, uh, a pole, an ace who was so modest no one had ever heard of him. And then uh, to add into the mixture as, uh, as contrast and comparison, uh, I, I've got a German as well. So just to get a little flavour of, of, of the men, here's a very short uh, video clip of Churchill's for you. If you could play that, Emily, thank you. There have been literally thousands of books about the Battle of Britain, and most of them uh, add, a, add something to the picture of the Battle of Britain that lots of people have, which is probably quite romantic. Um, but having talked to the pilots, talked to the men in Churchill's view, I realised that the, the picture that I wanted to tell was one that was, was unvarnished, was close up, uh, and, and was very honest. Um, and that's why I searched out not the famous names, but actually people whose stories had really never been told before. And I, um, I, I was first struck really by just how young they are. Um, let's just have the first uh, still, if we might. So th this is this is Geoffrey Page, who features in the book. And uh, well, during the Battle of Britain, he became twenty. So he was he was nineteen when he first started flying in the war, and that was the that was about the average age, uh, twenty. I think most of the men in the book are age twenty, and it's quite hard to imagine the future of of, of Britain in military conflict. Flicked being in the hands of first year university students, or as some of them were only 18, six formers, but they were incredibly courageous and did a remarkable job. Geoffrey was dramatically shot down uh, during the Battle of Britain, and he was in very, very badly burnt, his face and his hands, and he was one of the first uh, pilots to have innovative radical surgery uh, at the famous uh, unit in East Grinstead run by Sir Archibald Mackindoe and he became a founder member of what was called the guinea pig club the people who were experimented as it were on and he had 15 operations while he was there but uh, despite everyone saying you'll never fly again he got back in the plane and he flew at D-Day uh, and at Arnhem the second striking feature, um, let's, we'll move on to the next still. The second striking feature, uh, I think, was how modest the men I met were. Bob Doe, who we'll see in a second and who you saw at the, uh, in, in, in the clip at the beginning. Uh, he had also had an accident and his, his nose finished up on, on, on the top of his head. And he actually is one of the most successful pilots um, he's probably fourth, fifth, sixth on the, in the top 10 of pilots who shot down the most German planes and yet never went to reunions, no one ever heard of him. And I found him in uh, serving in a petrol station um, in, in Sussex. Um, and he, he was a, 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 an absolutely re remarkable man, but incredibly modest, modest like everyone uh, in Churchill's view. Um, I also tell the story of Polish pilots. We can lose the still now. They were incredibly experienced because they'd flown in Poland. Some had also flown in France, and they were also fanatical. They they would they they hated the Germans. The Germans had ripped through their country. Their their families were in peril, and they just wanted to get back at the, the Germans in in any way they could. And I think, um, in tune with the theme of um, unsung heroes, the the Polish pilots were under-recognized. It took them quite a long time uh, to really be involved in the Battle of, of, of Britain. Um, it took some time for the RAF authorities to think they were disciplined enough um, to be uh, RAF pilots. But in the end, they, they were very successful. They shot down a disproportionately large number of aircraft. 
but then after the war again, um, some of them were put in into displacement camps. Uh, there was a camp near Ipswich where someone I met was a squadron leader, um, a squadron leader who fought in the Battle of Britain, obviously was a very senior person and finished up in a displacement camp. Um, and it, it was probably not our, our proudest. So I wanted to make sure that the Poles had their, their fair share, as it were, within the book. Um, and then I added in um, a German, and I just thought this would be interesting. It's quite unusual in books about the Battle of Britain. I haven't seen hardly any uh, books that include the German perspective. And I wanted to both sort of compare whether the German was like his young uh, British counterparts or whether he was different. And we can have a look at a still now of uh, Ulrich Steinhilfer. Thank you. And uh, the conclusion I came to was that uh, Ulrich was actually very like the RAF pilots in the Battle of Britain. Ulrich himself was shot down uh, three days before the end of the Battle of Britain. Uh, he landed in a field near Canterbury, slightly injured, and he became a prisoner of war. And ultimately, I think he escaped five times. He moved to prison, a prison camp in, in Canada, and he just kept on trying to escape. Uh, and in the end, he... Uh, he stayed in the camp after five failed attempts and, and, and went home after the war. But he was like the, like the pilots and he got on very well with the, with, the, with the RAF pilots because they were both, they were patriotic rather than political. Um, they were both um, in love really with flying. It was like a fast car to them, only, only bigger and faster uh, and, and more expensive. But he, like the pilots in the RAF, uh, had seen lots of his um, companions killed and he, as he said in the clip at the beginning out of the 36 people in his wing only seven were left at the end of the Battle of Britain. So that's the story of, uh, of, of Churchill's few we can lose the still of Ulrich thank you and uh, I called the uh, on the cover it's called uh, you know it's a turning point in World War II and people say, oh, you know, was it really that important? Well, at that point, Hitler was undefeated. He was unstoppable. He'd ripped through Belgium, France, you know, following on from Czechoslovakia uh, and Poland. And he had, uh, to use a modern phrase, momentum. And it was really important that he was stopped there. Uh, it was obviously trickier for him to use his blitzkrieg tactics of, uh, of bombers and tanks uh, across the channel, that was an advantage. But um, the Battle of Britain pilots did a, an absolutely remarkable job to hold the Germans back. They were helped by uh, a, a tremendously good radar system, which the Germans didn't really know and understand, and by some mistakes on behalf of, of, of the Germans. And in the run up to the war, we just managed in a kind of slightly British um, skin of our teeth way to re equip our air force with. With, with, with good aircraft, but they did it. And uh, Hitler was then pushed, uh, pushed back and pushed into the arms or the rather chilly arms, might I say, of, of the Russians. Uh, uh, if he had invaded, then the rest of course would have been history and British history would have been very different indeed. Um, so let's go on uh, to the second, the second book. Um, which I wrote, which was published a little bit later in the summer. Um, in Churchill's few, um, we, we also meet uh, Geoffrey Myers, um, who wrote, who writes the secret letters. It was really only when it came to the 80th anniversary that I realised there was an opportunity to uh, republish with the support of his family the letters in, in a full form. Uh, Churchill's few only has, a, has some of them because he's only one of six characters but uh, in Secret Letters he and his wife Margot are our centre stage as it were. Um, so should we just have a picture of Geoffrey if we may? Uh, Jeff was an intelligence officer with 2-5 Squadron in the Battle of Britain. Uh, he was a journalist and he was Jewish. His wife Margot, let's have a look at Margot, was uh, trapped in Nazi occupied France uh, with her two young children, Robert, who you'll meet later, um, and his younger sister, Anne. And 
This was the family house, it had been a place of refuge for the family in the First World War. Mother, grandmother, um, aunt lived near, lived there or lived nearby. And it felt at the beginning of the war a safe place to be, but it didn't prove to be so. And um, uh, the couple, of course, were, 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 were separated. So um, Jeff decided to write uh, letters to Margot and to the children. Can we lose the picture of Margot? So he wrote, um, I'm going to hold up, hopefully you'll see, ha hand, handwritten letters um, in, in, these, in these notebooks. You can see some of it's written on RAF notepaper, RAF Martlesham Heath, it says. And at the top it says, secret and private. And he wasn't able to send letters uh, to his wife. It was just too dangerous. It was there was too much risk that someone would betray her, someone in the postal service, a neighbour would say there's an English woman, uh, husband's in the RAF, living in this village or that village. So they were kept in the book to be given to the family after the war and only to be read after the war if they all survived, if they were all alive. Um, in lots of ways, these letters, which um, are, are, are written quite often with some code where the names are are changed and I had to in work out what the name what the names were and some people had two code names but we I, we managed to do it and eventually I got some help from Robert um, but it's a it's, it's it's a really unique record I, I, I don't think of all the books about the Battle of Britain I've seen I've never seen anything quite like this because at one level uh, Jeff, who as a journalist of course, writes very, very um, eloquently. It's a tremendous arc of history in the first part of, uh, of, the, of the war. He was there for the Battle uh, of France. He was at Dunkirk and then he was in the Battle of Britain and, and, and afterwards. And indeed, he finished up as a, as a code breaker at Bletchley Park. So he, 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 he almost saw everything. And um, at the same time as you've got this broad picture of war, you've got a very intimate um, story of the relationship between Geoffrey and Margot, between a young couple who are separated and are both in danger um, and whose marriage and family are in peril and they're caught, as it were, in the, in the sort of crosshairs uh, of this conflict. Um, uh, and that gives the letters a, an intensity that you don't often see. So let's just get um, a feeling of them. Um, Christine, let's start with the first reading. For Geoffrey Myers, as the months of silence from wife Margot trapped in Nazi-occupied France grew, fear for his family's safety intensified. If you were still free, the Germans would be bound to find out sooner or later that you were the wife of an Englishman and they would then discover that you were the wife of a Jew and a journalist. The combination of all that is hated by the Nazis. They would have grounds for arresting you, saying that you had concealed your identity. You would be taken away from the babies, as I feared all along. Soon, I'll have the courage to take your photo out of my wallet and to look at the children. I don't do it because it hurts too much. They can't destroy my faith and confidence. Whatever happens, I'll always trust you, my lovey. There is something that binds us together that all the bombs in Europe cannot smash. Thank you, Christine. Uh, Margot was 25. Let's have a look at a picture of her. She, she had two children, as you can see, under five. Robert, Robert is the taller one. He's slightly different now, but uh, Robert is the uh, is is the bigger one. And as I say, we'll meet him later. And it's quite unusual, well, almost non-existent, really, in books about the Battle of Britain to have what they would say in Hollywood a big part for a woman. This is very evenly balanced. Uh, Margot's story is the equivalent of Jeffrey's. They're both equally important, and you see an incredibly remark, incredibly and remarkably resilient. Uh, young woman uh, and I'm really pleased that um, when uh, uh, 
friends who read it, women, women friends who read it, they really seem to find something special in it. So let's hear a little bit more about her. Let's lose the photograph and come back to Christy. Margot, a piano teacher in Paris, and her two children were living nervously with her mother at the family farm as the, Ger as the Germans ripped through France in 1940. In central France, despite her pianist hands, Margot Myers worked the farm hard, hoeing beets or bringing in the cows. The outdoor work brought some peace to her anxious mind. I savoured enormously the silence and solitude of the fields, despite the anguishing news of the war and worrying about Jeff. As the German grip on the area tightened, peace was no more. The rout had begun. Refugees blocked the roads, airplanes were shooting on civilians, and the French army was helpless. It was hell. Thank you. As I said, uh, Jeff Myers was an intelligence officer, and it was his job to report every day the successes and failures of his squadron in the Battle of Britain. And that was reported to Fighter Command HQ and was part of the, the jigsaw puzzle that were, was being put together on a daily basis of uh, the strengths and weaknesses of the defence and the German attack. But he also was more than that. Um, he had such a developed um, sense of humanity, such compassion, that he saw it as a really important part of his job to care for, look after, nurture, support the, the very young pilots in his care. And he was about 10 years younger than them, so he'd had a little bit of experience and he felt, I think, like, a, like an older brother to them rather than um, their, one, of their, one of their superior officers. Uh, and of course, in the Battle of Britain, um, uh, many young pilots were killed or badly injured. And in a few seconds, their lives would change uh, forever, and indeed the lives of their partners. So, On return, Jeff was plunged into the Battle of Britain. He was a great support to the handful of young pilots who were married. Terry, the wife of pilot officer David Hunt, had only been married for seven weeks, and Terry recalled their newly wedded wartime life. I would get into bed with David already asleep prop myself up against the wooden rails of the bed and watch the dark and the searchlights. I looked at the searchlights away over the aerodrome and there was David's breathing, an occasional plane engine roaring when the plane itself might soar like a ghost across the window. Time barely moved. Certainly, it was not to be measured. That soon changed when her husband was shot down and badly burned his new wife wrote, David was lying on the bed. The newness of his accident was the sensation in the room. He himself was something brand new and very real. I saw him just for a moment, his face and arms purple with fresh dye and swollen. I thought, he has no eyes. And I thought they had not told me that, but had left me to find out quietly for myself and curiously how wise they were. Behind all this was David. I saw then, as I cannot see now, how we should manage his blindness. Christine, thank you, that was, that was beautiful. One of the things that I think makes these secret letters so compelling is the parallel narratives. By day, Jeff Myers was anxious about the fate of the young pilots in his squadron. Uh, he uh, was intelligence officer in probably the worst run squadron, certainly in the first half of the Battle of Britain. Um, Death and disaster um, was a daily companion uh, for for most of them. Uh, they had a, a leader who was 
sadly probably too old in, in his 30s um, and also not really up to the job. And then by night, his worries switched to worrying about his family. Uh, months went by and he didn't hear uh, how they were, what the Germans were up to, whether they were still safe. So let's um, lose the still of, uh, of Jeff, Margot and young Robert and Christine. Just a few days before the end of the Battle of Britain, Jeff Myers described in a letter to his wife, yet another pilot in his squadron being killed. I saw a great fire a few hundred yards away from our dispersal point. I didn't even know he was in the middle of the fire. A few minutes before he went, we were joking together. It was like a funeral pyre. The fuselage and wings began to bend and crumple with glowing agony. Finally, there was only the heat and cracking silence and ashes. The love story turbocharged by the serious danger they were both in intensified as months without contact passed. Ducky, I do hope you will see me again. I long to see you and my little ones. But if I am no longer here when the war is over, keep your confidence in eternal things. We had seven wonderful years together, my love. We may have no more on earth. You may never see my letters. And yet we are bound up in the scheme of things eternal. Your thoughts are my thoughts. Your life is my life. If we come together again, old age can but strengthen our intertwined branches. If we do not come together, I will still be with you and the children will feel my presence through you, my love. When I breathe these words, the tender parts within me throb in harmony with you. Thank you, Christine. I think that that reading was a really good example of this, of the, of the twin anxieties that uh, that he was that he was facing that go all the way uh, through the book. Um, but as as the Battle of Britain came to an end and we moved on to the next phase of the war, still dangerous, um, but not quite so. Um, he Jeff got more and more worried about the lack of news from France. Uh, it, it appeared in, in, the, in the British press and indeed in Parliament that the remaining British citizens in France, and there were quite a number, were being rounded up um, and being put in camps. And that really um, uh, alerted, alerted Jeff to the urgency uh, of the plight of his family if they were still alive. And in the local town, the, the, uh, the, the prison was turned into a uh, a kind of Gestapo run uh, dungeon and increasingly they picked up Jews, resistance fighters uh, and torture uh, and deportation to, uh, to concentration camps became the order of the day. So uh, Margot Myers was in grave danger um, and what do you do? Do you stay? In, with your family, with your parent, with your mother and your grandmother in a place that you think is safe? Or do you take your two children on a dangerous journey across the demarcation line, which you might not get across through Spain, Portugal, and hopefully somehow to England? So Christine, let's lose the photo and let's have the final extract if we might. In central France, the Gestapo started imprisoning resistance fighters and Jews in the nearby town. Margot's concerns sharpened. She saw in the distance a German soldier on a motorbike making his way up to the house. Was he looking for Jews? Or for English children? Margot's heart pounded. Even her little son Robert could sense the tension and then the relief as the soldier smiled and then asked in halting French if he could buy some eggs. Margot knew it was time to escape. Margot found a local couple who were passeurs, smugglers of people across the demarcation line into Vichy, France. The passeur said, don't bring any luggage. Dress 
as if you are just going from one farm to another. The family should appear just as normal, no luggage, no special clothes. Leaving was terrible. We say goodbye to my mother and grandmother. Aunt Marcel accompanied us on her bike. I was pedaling too with the two kids behind in the trailer. When we reached the rise, Aunt Marcel stopped. We said goodbye and weeping, she watched us continue on our way. Margot had no idea when or if she would ever see her mother again. England and her husband seemed impossibly distant. She was caught between wanting to be with her French family and needing to be safe with her husband once again. Now, she was solely responsible for two young children with thousands of miles of danger ahead. Christine, thank you for all those really fabulous readings. Uh, they were beaut beaut beautifully done, thank you. Um, <laughs> You just imagine the situation, 25-year-old woman, two tiny kids with absolutely nothing, not a spare inch of clothes, absolutely nothing, just uh, just some uh, documents, passport, which she'd buried um, for the last few weeks, but um, she took the passport, so they were handed to the people smuggler, and she was given a false, false documents to go across the demarcation line, um, and she prayed when she saw how um, amateur the documents were that she wouldn't get uh, she wouldn't get picked up. I won't tell you what happened next, but I can say that a few days afterwards, the Germans came looking for her. They came looking for that English woman. Um, they uh, went to the uh, the town hall in the village and said, "Where is she?" So Margot escaped by the skin of her teeth and just in time. Uh, and I'm really pleased she did because otherwise we probably wouldn't have. Robert here to join us. Uh, Robert, welcome. And um, wh what's it been like for you seeing the story of your parents, um, very romantic, very emotional in places, uh, there in, in print? Well, as you say, it's, uh, it is very emotional. Um, <clears throat> and uh, it makes me realize when I when I read it and read your book what they went through and I suppose as a kid I didn't know uh, the agonies uh, and and the difficulties that they went through because they were always very um, positive uh, about uh, <clears throat> about life uh, it was quite clear that they were very much in love and they stayed that way right through their lives. I can remember uh, leaving Bochmer as uh, my grandmother's place, uh, and I can remember uh, a few things uh, on the journey uh, to Spain and Portugal. The first one, of course, was, was going through the escaping across the border uh, it was absolutely bucketing down, pouring with rain. Uh, my mother was pushing my sister in a wheel, in a little wheelchair, uh, a little um, child's pushchair, and I was on the saddle of uh, the the passeur's wife, uh, bicycle, and uh, that that way we went. Uh, we went because it was so uh, <clears throat> so uh, wet. The uh, German sentries didn't get out of their sentry box, and we just walked through. A complete miracle. Of course, the other side. Once we had got to unoccupied France, to Vichy France, um, we were the refugees. And uh, they're obviously a route that others took. And we were very badly received when we got to the little village, uh, the other side. And uh, we fortunately, um, briefly, 
uh, were sorry when my when when my mother uh, sh <clears throat> showed what plight she was in with two little children absolutely soaking wet uh, she did uh, <clears throat> she did allow us to go into her her little cafe and from there uh, she helped us, in fact, to get in touch with a with a taxi, uh, and we were taken to uh, uh, another local town, which was bigger, where we spent 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 the night, and um, were able to dry out properly, and uh, for my mother to fix up the. Uh, uh, another taxi uh, through, that would take us to <clears throat> that would take us to um, friends of my mother. My mother went because uh, my grandmother's place was quite close to the border. My uh, my mother had a friend who she was best friend, in fact, a best school friend who was on the uh, <clears throat> on the unoccupied part of France and she managed to get a taxi to take us there. They didn't know we were coming. My mother didn't know whether they were still there. There was no communication between the two parts of France uh, as far as we were concerned and we were wonderfully received in fact there uh, and um, this then uh, allowed my mother to get all the necessary papers uh, from, from either Vichy or Lyon uh, to get through Spain and uh, get a visa to go into Portugal. And that took her about three months, I think, uh, patiently going to the various uh, uh, authorities in Vichy and in, uh, and in Lyon with the uh, the embassies, and she had. You'll just you'll hear, you'll see it in the book. She had some pretty nasty experiences with that, but she certainly was a, a tough uh, young girl, which she was then, um, and uh, did that a lot of the journeys on her bicycle. And uh, we then went by train, uh, very very crowded, unpleasant journeys. Which I remember vividly, to Portugal, and there it was complete change because Portugal was neutral; uh, it was prosperous uh, compared to Spain, that had been through a civil war, which was which was a disaster. And we went to we stayed in Estoril, which is a resort, and it was still a resort in those days. And we had a, a remarkable, um, well, nice time. My sister and I enjoyed uh, enjoyed the uh, the beach, and uh, we waited. I was ill, uh, quite badly ill, which held things up a bit, but I got over it fortunately. And then we went. We were, We then managed to get a boat to uh, Gibraltar. Uh, to join a convoy that was going to go from Gibraltar to England, or to Britain rather, I should say. Um, on the on the boat to Gibraltar, we were attacked, and I remember going on deck. It was very cold. Uh, we had our life jackets on, and uh, the people were milling around. But uh, I was told to be good, which I was. I could sense the danger. And then we arrived in, uh, in Gibraltar where we spent a few weeks uh, <clears throat> waiting for the convoy to come. And uh, then we, were, we had a very straightforward, apart from the start of the journey where uh, the uh, we were in fact in a 
Cunarda that had been converted to a troop ship. And uh, that was attacked as well. But uh, <clears throat> there was some scurrying about and aeroplanes and uh, a big bang when a, um, when a um, <clears throat> depth charge went off, chase away the submarine. And that was the only uh, action right at the start that, uh, that, that I saw or that the, um, the convoy saw as far as I know. And we then went uh, right across out into the mid-Atlantic and uh, right round far south of Iceland and came in to Glasgow from the north. Uh, and my mother right through that uh, journey said that she always slept in her clothes because uh, she wanted to be ready in case in case we were we, we were attacked and sunk and when we got to Glasgow we we then uh, disembarked went to a hotel and I remember we in the morning when we woke up my father who'd obviously come up on the night train from Martlesham uh, coming into the room and I remember it absolutely vividly my mother went over to him and he picked her up light as a feather, uh, which of course for me was a, was a wonderful thing. And that really is the story of our escape. Robert, were you, uh, is, um, you've given away the plot of the book, but um, were, you, were you aware of, uh, as a young child, were you aware that you were in danger or were you just busy thinking, oh, I'm going to play on the beach in Estoril and it's all lovely? Well, no, I, 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 was, I was definitely aware that we were in danger in France and when we were escaping, obviously. I, I knew that. I knew, I knew that uh, we weren't just going for a, a friendly walk. Uh, in... in, in uh, in Portugal, no, I wasn't. I, I th we we didn't. Uh, there was no feeling of danger there. There was obviously the feeling of danger on the boat from time to time. But uh, once we had crossed the de the demarcation line, uh, we were relatively free. My father got a, my mother got a pension from the uh, from the British government, and. Uh, there was no sense there was in, in in that particular case there was no sense of danger my mother knew the general picture of course uh, which she describes about uh, well particularly when germany attacked russia she thought oh, that's good that uh, is the the worst over she felt that uh, the war had been won then and what what how would you describe the, the personality, the character of, of your father and, and, and then of your mother? Well, my mother was a, a pianist and uh, the piano was definitely her, her passion. Uh, my father was, and, and she was, uh, she was a, a thoughtful and uh, determined person. She used to practice uh, because she was a, a professional uh, pianist. When, when she got back to the piano after looking after the children, she used to spend most of the day uh, at the piano uh, practicing. She was very, very um, centered. And uh, she was uh, clever in, in a quiet sort of way. Very clever, very sensible. Um, she told me that she never had any doubts once she had set off that she would get to to Britain. She had uh, no fear, she said. She just put one foot in front of the next and uh, ha had complete confidence that she would she would make the journey. At the same time, she was obviously conscious of the uh, of the danger, but she felt that she would make it. My father was um, was an extremely kind person. He he uh, 
uh, <clears throat> was very sensitive to other people. Uh, so, and he, 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 he really suffered uh, the, the, f the fate of the, of the pilots. And um, he was also, he was very clever and also very, very conscientious. So this, this combination, I suppose, allowed him to be a successful um, intelligence officer and then move on to, to Bletchley Park. And he had had, um, uh, he had spent time as a journalist in Berlin and had spent and had seen the rise of, of uh, Hitler. So he uh, was uh, one of the first to join up uh, in, in the RAF and he fought his little his little war, which was in intelligence, not on the front line or anything, with with huge uh, determination and passion. When he was at Bletchley, he worked ceaselessly uh, on top of uh, looking after after us and having an allot allotment. And uh, uh, he, he really worked hard. And he, he was a yes, he was a a clever a clever and a kind man. Uh, Robert, thank you so much for, uh, for your um, relating your experience uh, and also for your insight. I, I can vouch for that. I, 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 I met your father when he was alive and you knew that you were in the presence of someone who had a really good set of values, uh, who was an exceptional human being and exceptional human beings also sometimes, you know, quite often have exceptional careers because you can't really differentiate uh, between the person and 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 the professional um, and I also will add um, that you know he had a, a good sense of humor too there was a kind of twinkle in his eyes uh, quite often and that just comes through a little bit in, in in the book I think so thank you so much for that Christine thank you once again for a beautiful reading you certainly deserve the gold disc behind you um, much much deserve gold disc for readings uh, thank you. And I'm going to hand you back to Jill. I think there's an opportunity for questions which you can... Um... I just want to say one last thing, uh, if I may, John. I think that your, my father would have really appreciated uh, your book. Uh, I know that uh, when you interviewed him, he told me uh, how impressed he was with you. And I'm certain that he would be extremely, extremely pleased that this story has been published. Thank you very much. That's a really, uh, for, 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 for an author and for me, that's a really lovely thing to hear. So thank you very much. That's very, uh, very uh, touching and, and, and reassuring that I did a, a decent job by him. So that uh, is a big responsibility. Thank, thank you very much. So back, back to Jill. Um, now, I'm going to start by asking questions, but I just have to thank Robert for that wonderful interview because it was totally fascinating and deeply moving. Um, anyway, so um, my first question really is rather an obvious one, uh, John, because I want to know how you came to be so involved with the story and so interested in the Battle of Britain. Well, um... In about 1980, uh, I discovered that my father, who was a writer, uh, but also uh, as a young man was a, uh, a, a political activist. He was uh, chair of the Labour League of Youth and he was a prominent young anti-fascist uh, chasing Oswald Mose and his men around the streets of East London. And I discovered, uh, and I think he discovered too completely randomly, that he was on Hitler's death list the list of people who would be immediately arrested, picked up, incarcerated, and no doubt uh, killed. There was a, a couple of thousand people on it. And one of the Sunday papers just had one page picture from it. They just happened to do the page with my dad's name on. So I was absolutely astonished. And then I thought, well, if it hadn't been for the young men in the Battle of Britain, I, prob I wouldn't have been born, probably, uh, because uh, my father wouldn't have been here to, to be my father. So um, I became at that point really interested in the Battle of Britain and it wasn't long after that I started putting together this, uh, the book, 
and then I made a documentary, uh, sort of in parallel with the book, uh, for Yorkshire Television uh, back in the 1980s, um, which was obviously helpful uh, to the book. And at that point, I met all the pilots, interviewed them, met um, uh, met Jeff Myers, met Robert's dad. He gave me a, a typewritten copy of of the Secret Letters. I didn't really think about it all that much until we came up to the 80th anniversary and. Someone said, oh, I really like those letters in the book. And I, I, I thought, well, I wonder, I, I showed them uh, actually to my publisher. So, oh, you know, is there enough here for a, a book? And I did a bit more digging around. But, you know, in the end, there really, really was. And I, I, I feel particularly, you know, having heard what Robert has just said, that it, it worked, uh, you know, it worked really, um, it worked really well. So uh, it, I owe this to my dad. Fantastic. Thank you. Um now, I think that um, uh, th there will be some more questions for you uh, from uh, Emily, uh, but uh, is she there? If not, I'd be most happy to ask another question. Hello. Yes, I am here. Sorry, I'm having awful tech problems. Um, so everyone can ask, anyone can ask questions with the Q&A function at the bottom, or they can put the, press the raise your hand button, and then you can, um, I can allow you to speak and ask your own question. Uh, we don't have any at the minute, so Jill, would you like to ask another one? I certainly would. Um, I would, would like to know, uh, uh, Robert, if you can see me, uh, what uh, I, I'm terribly impressed by Archibald McKindo and his wonderful work as a plastic surgeon with all those pilots. And uh, it seems to me that uh, it was only someone like him that could have done all that wonderful work with them because uh, not only did they have their faces more or less rearranged, but he had to work on their psychology and and build them up. Um, so he was a key person in their recoveries. Is that right? Um, shall, I, shall I answer that, Robert? Because I think I probably know the, the Mackindo story uh, uh, quite well. And no, you're absolutely right. He did two things. One was he threw he was a pioneer, he was a bit of a maverick, he's a New Zealander, uh, and because I think in wartime sometimes you have to trust mavericks uh, because they're the ones who change things and get things done, he was given quite a lot of authority at the hospital and he introduced lots of new uh, uh, techniques for, for, for burns victims, but you're absolutely right Jill, more than that he treated the whole person, he, he understood that one of the, one of the difficulties was how, for example, you manage relationships. You may have been married, um, as was um, uh, David Hunt, who we heard about earlier earlier on, or, or, or Jeff, uh, Jeff Page was, uh, you know, had a girlfriend. What, 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 what happens to relationships, uh, for example? So he, he tried to normalize things. He tried to encourage them to meet other people. He let them go into East Grinstead. He talked to the mayor of East Grinstead and said, look, I, I want your town to welcome these people. They'd go to the local pub. Um, and it was really, really important part of it because it's a very difficult thing. Um, Bob Doe, the, the, the pilot ace whose nose finished on the top of his head, was also uh, uh, had severe burns and he was married and um, his wife couldn't couldn't face him with a with a different face, with a ruined face, and that was it. I mean, he, he married again later, and it was all uh, fine. Um, so I think Mackindo was absolutely was a genius, uh, the sort of genius that you'd only find in wartime. In peacetime, they would have kept him uh, under control, but in, in wartime, uh, he was given uh, rain, free rein to do what he did, and he did it brilliantly. Yeah, and I, I love the fact that they were all guinea pigs. That was that they were they, they, they were all united and described themselves as guinea pigs, didn't they? <laughs> they described themselves as guinea pigs because they were guinea pigs. They were being, yes. being experimented on and some of it probably yeah. didn't work out, but they had a lot of operations. And he did say that the thing that was most difficult were, were hands, were not faces. Um, and I don't know, uh, but he said that the, the thing that, um, that women found most difficult was looking at the, looking at the hands, was, was seeing the hands, but clearly that was a very difficult, people thought that's the end of their marriage and some, some relationships uh, continued and some uh, uh, failed as a result of the, uh, of the terrible injuries, but he was a, he was a remarkable man. The, the, the other, just while I'm on remarkable, the, the other, lest we think this is, um, uh, the Battle of Britain was won by men, 
there was an extraordinary woman um, called Beatrice Schilling, who um, worked at the uh, Royal Aircraft Establishment in Farnborough. And uh, early on in the Battle of Britain, there was a problem with the Spitfires and that when they were chased by the Germans and went downwards, they stalled and crashed, absolutely disaster. And uh, the, the RAF, they couldn't work it out. And, but Beatrice Schilling, um, who was also a motorbike racer, invented a, a, just a small little washer that she then, on her motorbike, went to every Spitfire in the country and sorted it out and inserted these washers, or the washers probably, they were a bit more sophisticated than that, um, but inserted them in the Spitfire engines and the problem uh, was over and they could they could go downwards absolutely fine without stalling and so um, her, her role in the Battle of Britain is uh, also underreported maybe in another book. How fantastic that is absolutely amazing but I'm I would like to mention Geoffrey Plate perhaps you've had enough of me here is Robert again. Robert? No, I don't think he's Sorry. Uh, uh, well, shall I? Can I ask my next question yes, then? Ask your next question. Uh, well, I, I was, I was um, terribly, uh, well, and I'm sure everybody was uh, moved by um, Geoffrey Page's experience because he had such a prolonged horror, you know, from and and everything that happened to him, the fact that he was burning and he could see bits of himself floating away from him and that he still had the presence of mind to somehow get the parachute open. And um, it, it was the most amazing story, wasn't it? The way he, he uh, his sheer courage and, and the way he was able to um, open the parachute, for example, because if your hands are on, are burning and bits of fl flesh are falling off them. It's no easy job doing these things, but he managed to do it and he managed to get out and survive and, and get the parachute open. And I found that very moving. It, it, it was an extraordinary story and he was an extraordinary man. And yes. I spoke to the, the pilot in the plane next to him when he was hit by the Luftwaffe and he said it was like a fireball and he couldn't imagine for one second that Jeffrey Page could survive it but he did and I think when he landed in the water his survival instincts which we probably all have really kicked in and however painful it was um, he did with his very badly burnt hands manage to click open his parachute because otherwise a big silk umbrella you know might have might have drowned him um, and he thrashed about in the water and he eventually was was uh, was 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 rescued, um, but he then became a guinea pig. Uh, had lots of operations, uh, and even Mackindo said, "I'm not sure you can fly again, Jeffrey." And he said, "Yes, I will. Yes, I will." And they they took him back to you know training squadrons, and but he wanted to get back into action. Uh, and in the end, uh, he, he did, and he he swore that for every operation he had, he had 15 at the time. He'd shoot down a German plane. And I think he shot 17 German planes down and he is one of the only people who became a guinea pig twice because after he did he flew at D-Day and then he flew at Arnhem and he crashed at Arnhem broke his back and um, had more burns and so became one of only two double guinea pigs I think. It's absolutely incredible isn't it I mean that, that he could survive all that is just almost yeah. beyond belief he must have had great uh, mental courage I uh, think. He was, a, he was quite a character. <laughs> yes yes. Quite amazing. So we have a question here from Richard who says um, how long did it take you to complete the books from the time you first decided to put pen to paper? Well the, the first book took quite a long time because uh, I, I, I was working uh, in television um, I, I, which was very not just full-time but beyond full-time. I had two young children so I called this a Sunday morning kitchen table book. So the only time I really ever got to write it was on Sunday mornings, um, you know, in the kitchen while um, uh, my wife kindly took out, uh, took the children out for a walk and I scribbled away. So it took, it took, um, it probably took about three years to write the first book. The second one, partly because obviously lots of the words were already written by Robert Myers's dad, I probably wrote in three or four months uh, incredibly fast and it was because there was a deadline you know the anniversary of the Battle of Britain doesn't wait 
you can't be too late for that. If you want a book to be published for the anniversary of the Battle of Britain, it was published on Battle of Britain Day. You can't afford to, to dally about. And I probably would have liked you know, you know another couple of weeks on it to, to polish it up a little bit more, but I, I just had to do it. So uh, fortunately, um, uh, things like um, lockdown one were quite helpful. So um, I had a little bit of time and I managed to, to get it done, but I probably did that in four months, I think. And the other one probably closer to four years. Thank you. We have another question from Tony. Um, what happened to those who survived the war? Were they damaged by their experiences? Well, I think, well, of course, one of the things you, you forget about the Battle of Britain is that there were, once it was over, there was another four, nearly, there was another five years of war to go. And quite a lot of people who survived the Battle of Britain died later in the war in another, you know, another theatre of war. Um, uh, you somehow assume there was a sort of end point, but there wasn't, it, you know, it went on. Um, I think that uh, I wouldn't, some were clearly damaged by what happened. Uh, I think everyone was changed. Um, when the most dramatic thing in your life happens when you're 20 years of age, you're, you become a guinea pig, you're badly burnt, um, you, you, you worry about whether your wife can uh, cross with your children across the demarcation line. You're flying in mortal danger every day. Whatever happens next um, is, in some ways, is an anticlimax. Um, and I think that some Battle of Britain pilots felt that they they reached that they peaked very early, um, and it was quite difficult to replicate the the comradeship, the, the excitement, uh, the danger, uh, the adrenaline of what had happened. Uh, during during the war, so I, I wouldn't say they're dam they were damaged. Uh, some uh, probably were, but I would say that that virtually all of them were, were changed quite quite dramatically. I think the other thing that it did was there were people. One of the um, pilots in the book is a sergeant pilot from Cheshire, very humble background. Uh, he finished up as a squadron leader, uh, and if you were good at what you did, um, it didn't matter in the end whether you were a sergeant or whether you were a flight lieutenant by the end of the war he'd become um uh, he'd become a squadron leader and i think uh, that was the other thing it, it, it moved people through the british uh, hierarchical class system uh, quite easily sometimes and that was the, the case with bob doe wasn't it uh, that he uh, you know had a wonderful uh, for him, it was an escape from a very mundane existence. Yeah, I mean, he was a you know he was a post boy for a newspaper, left school at, at sixteen, and he finished up as a wing commander in the yes. in the um, and that that changed him all, of course. I might say something about uh, my father's uh, post war experience was the. the 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 Battle of Britain and the the war. <clears throat> the war years had a huge impact on his on his outlook. He had been, uh, as I said earlier, he had been um, in Germany, and I have German German friends. And uh, at the end of the war, he <clears throat> he had to debrief some of the uh, the. Uh, uh, Luftwaffe's uh, pilots and their their commanders, and he found that very interesting. And he was very he had a, a a very good rapport with them, because he had huge respect, in the in the way that I liked so much about in in your your first book, uh, John, where you you took the um, uh, the German pilot and gave him uh, a good a big place there's there's one one thing that my father said was that he was very very conscious that uh, the pilots in Germany were going through the same agonies that uh, his his pilots as it were were going through and after the war he had one burning uh, desire was that the two countries should heal their wounds. Uh, we had a German au pair and my sister 
learned German as her, her third language. Uh, he, he was extremely keen uh, as it followed up on the uh, Iron and Steel Federation and then the uh, European Union. He, and he saw that develop with, with great uh, uh, pride. And uh, <clears throat> I'm glad to say he hasn't seen what has happened recently. But it was, a, it was a, something that was incredibly important to him, that uh, we should heal. point. Uh, so um, I saw that Joan had her hand up, which if you would like to talk, I can allow you to hear. So let's see if Joan has a question. Hey, I'm unmuted. Um, just to introduce myself to those who don't know me, I'm Joan Ruddock and I chair the Friends of Blackheath Hall. So I'd just like to say to all of you, this has been an absolutely wonderful evening. I mean, uh, the, everything that's been said is so fascinating, so moving, beautifully read. Um, and of course, thanks to Jill for her introductions and uh, the thanks that will come for sure at the end. I wanted to ask if, um, John, you had any further follow up with the German airmen because we've heard quite a lot about the, uh, the English airmen and what happened in their subsequent lives and obviously about Robert's life in particular. But I wonder about him, I'm particularly interested because when I was a very small child, um, my grandparents had a small holding and German prisoners of war were sent to my grandfather uh, to work on the land. And um, it was very obvious the differences between them. Um, one was a very, very lovely man who made little wooden toys for us children. And the other was an absolutely committed Nazi who would go around cursing and spitting because he hated us all so much. So I wonder, John, what you found? I, well, I, I, I didn't have a wide cross-section. Cross I obviously knew Ulrich Steinhilfer well, went to visit, visit him in Germany, um, and I met some other German pilots. And the ones I, I, I met, I think, were, you know, were, were very um, uh, mirror images of the, of the, uh, of, of the British pilots. Uh, Ulrich was uh, imprisoned um, uh, as a POW, first of all in Sheffield, and then uh, he was moved to Canada. He escaped, um, as I said, five or six times. On one occasion, he escaped by um, uh, hiding underneath a train that was going from Canada into, um, into the USA, uh, and he was underneath the train. The train at, at Niagara Falls went across the border and he thought, right, I'm safe, I must get off. And then it reversed back again over the line, back to Canada, and he was caught. So he wasn't, he wasn't always lucky, but he had a very successful career. He was a, a senior executive at IBM. Um, uh, I've been in touch with his son uh, since the publication of the book here uh, this summer, um, uh, who's also uh, an, an academic engineer. Um, and I, I would say that he had a very successful life. I think one of the things that it did for several of the men, and he was one of them, it sort of, it meant writing the, the book when it first came out, not the updated version, it gave them permission to be open because people don't always talk even to their families, their children, uh, or to people they meet on the small holdings um, about what their experience and was and what their feelings were. And Bob Doe, who'd been very um, quiet, hidden, despite being a you know, superb pilot, wrote a book, uh, or his daughter wrote a book about him, uh, which uh, which was uh, were published and was was good. Ulrich Steinhilper wrote a couple of books, and I, I think that's one of the things that that it did. I think they wanted to have a catharsis and and and, and get it all out. So I, I I would say you know, and I talked to Ulrich that he was. Um, uh, he was a German and not a Nazi, if that makes sense. I think that he you know, was just doing the job that uh, he was meant to be doing, um, just as, as our pilots were. Um, and uh, he, 
his father, I think, was a member uh, of the party and his mother was absolutely resolutely not. Um, and that caused a bit of, sort of family uh, conflict when he was growing up uh, or, you know, in the in the in the mid in the mid 30s. Um, but but I would say that he, he he wasn't a Nazi. But I can equally I can equally see how 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 some were and and, and some weren't, uh, as you found, Joan. Mm -hmm. Any more, Emily? Emily, Emily, are there any more questions? No, we, we don't have any more questions. Uh, in that case, I think we should uh, bring this event to a, an end, if that's all right uh, with you, uh, dear John. No, um, that's, that's, that's fine. That's, that's fine. I'd like a glass of wine now. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> all I'm fine. fine, thank you. Um, <laughs> Uh, I, I just want to say finally that this has been the most wonderful event. Uh, you yourself has con contributed a huge amount and we were, I am so grateful to um, the son of uh, uh, Geoffrey Myers, Robert Myers, coming today and talking himself. That has been absolutely wonderful for us. And I'd also like to thank our contributors, our beautiful actress, Christine, who read these wonderful moving letters. Well, wasn't that fantastic? So I think we've had a pretty good team, mm -hmm. <laughs> quite honestly. And I think it's been a wonderful event. But uh, if, if Emily. And I would like to, uh, my husband's whispered, don't forget to thank Emily. So dear Emily, <laughs> we're thanking you too. <laughs> so uh, uh, on that and, note. And the book is available. Um, we know that Waterstones in Blackheath Village have it. And of course, you know, uh, online, Amazon, and everything else uh, have it. So, um, if you enjoy, it, please, please, please buy a, a copy so I can get my own gold disc. <laughs> perfect, perfect Christmas present. presents, I would say. Thank you. I'm happy for anyone, anyone in you know South London. I'm very happy if it helps to sign a copy. Of course, um, Emily knows where I am. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much. Thank you. And good night, everyone. Good night, Christine, Robert. Thank you. Good night. Bye. Good night. Good night.